Salutations and felicitations. I am David Helmanak. Thank you to all who have been able to join us this afternoon. A special thanks to my advisor, Dr. Yi, as well as my other committee members, Dr. Frigo, Dr. Medeiros, and Dr. Povanelli, for taking the time both to review the written portion of the work and make time this afternoon for this uh, defense. Today, I will be presenting an overview of my thesis work conducted over the past couple of years on a deep learning approach to dynamic sampling or DLODs, more specifically for its usage in maximizing throughput for nano DESI MSI imaging technology. This presentation should take roughly an hour if we move quickly enough, with 15 to 20 minutes reserved at the end for questions. If you do have a question, please note the slide number in the lower right and we can come back to it. First though, is a quick acknowledgement that this work has been made possible by a National Institute of Health grant through the HubMap or Human Biomolecular Atlas Program Consortium. HubMap's objective is to advance biological imaging technologies with the intent of creating a single cell resolution map of human tissues. I would also be remiss at this point not to also extend our thanks to our collaborators at Purdue University, Dr. Julia Laskin and her student, Hang Hu, for their ongoing sharing of data and experience. So this presentation will be led off with an overview of what exactly is NanoDesi MSI, the concept of sparse sampling, and a look at the dynamic sparse sampling algorithm, SLODs. Thereafter, I will be addressing the primary research objectives, the pre-processing required for the available DESI MSI data, and the new DLODs architecture. The presentation will wrap up looking at simulated results, consideration of future work, and then thereafter followed by a dedicated time for questions. So, mass spectrometry technologies are used to measure the relative intensity of signals for different masses. This produces a spectrum across multiple mass charge ratios, or MZ, shown on the left, signifying the presence and abundance of different molecules and chemical compounds. An example of such a spectrum is shown here. Um, this process can be generalized beyond singular point measurements to two or even three dimensions for spatial imaging, taking the sum or integrating the area under the curve for a slice or window of all the spectra obtained for, uh, for particular molecules uh, produces a visualization, an example of which is shown on the right. For a whole high resolution sample, such as the one shown, there can easily be millions of unique MZ, all of which are stored in a proprietary encrypted data structure. For the hardware in this project, that would be the Finnegan RAW format. Each RAW file contains all of the information necessary for a single row in the sample, with lists of MZ value and intensity pairs stored for individual locations. Each of these locations is associated with an acquisition time. These lists allow the data to be compactly stored, but the spectrum data is not natively indexed. And critically, it is not consistent, either in which MZ are actually being obtained, nor what horizontal positions are actually being sampled. The actual mechanisms used to extract molecules from a sample for analysis can vary quite significantly. Though there are three prominent methods used in both research and industry. First, there is MALDI, or Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. Then there is SIMS, or Secondary Ion Mass Spectroscopy. And then there is DESI, or Desorption Electrospray Ionization. MALDI may be the most popular method due to it having excellent resolution and molecular specificity. As its name implies, it uses a laser to ionize molecules into a gas which are then fed through a mass spectrometer. However, the one to two micrometer resolution cited here is a relatively recent development. And there also remains a set of complex preparation steps for actually using the uh, tissue with this method, 
And it also requires operation within a vacuum, which makes it particularly uh, less practical in certain laboratory settings. SIMS doesn't have these limitations, but it does use a beam of ions to sputter the surface of the sample, which effectively destroys it. In contrast, DESI deposits a charged solvent through a capillary, as shown on the right, onto the sample, and then draws the liquid back into the spectrometer. Recent work done at Purdue allows for uh, spatial resolutions better than 10 micrometers, still with negligible levels of required sample preparation, and it also doesn't require operation within a vacuum. The uh, nanodesi is also non-destructive, which means we can achieve multiple scans and higher tissue throughput in, in a laboratory setting. Now, MSI in general obtains rather absurdly large quantities of molecular information. And it's become both a unique and critical tool in medical research. However, this comes at the price of time investment. So each single position in a sample can take upwards of 10 seconds to actually measure. This means that to use nanodesi on a sample, as for example, the uh, uterine section that's shown on the right, uh, processing over 104,000 locations takes roughly four hours. This is in large part due to the reliance on using a traditional raster scanning pattern seen in the top right. This obtains not only data that is irrelevant to an experimentalist's objectives, but also just in terms of the background information. So for the sample shown, roughly 50% of the total area is highlighted in red, contains no tissue at all. Generalizing from this example, there exists a clear potential for the throughput to be doubled without any losses. This leads to the idea of integrating sparse sampling into nanodesi, where only locations that probably contain information that the experimentalist is actually interested in should actually be scanned. Now, sparse sampling either can be used with a statically defined pattern with more advanced variations usually being produced with stochastic models, for very specific scenarios, or else through dynamic means. Dynamic sparse sampling will actively rely on information obtained during a scan to inform future measurement locations. These methods are principally based in compressed sensing and or machine learning. And this brings us to the SLODS algorithm, or a supervised learning approach to dynamic sampling which performs dynamic sparse sampling, as its name implies, determining measurement locations through a trained supervised learning model. As outlined on the right, given a set of random measurements, a model is used to uh, estimate the potential reduction in distortion, an ERD, for remaining unmeasured locations, based principally on a reconstruction image. The location with maximal ERD is selected for scanning, after which the new information is used to update the reconstruction. If sufficient measurements have been made, then the procedure will terminate, and otherwise it will repeat until doing so. The overall operation is shown on the left and then animated in the video on the bottom for a past implementation with Raman spectroscopy, where SLODS reduces the number of measurements by a factor of six. Now, when I was initially approached to work on SLODs, I was distinctly aware of a growing trend within medical research at the time uh, to use random sparse sampling and then relying on deep learning and adversarial networks, GANs, to perform reconstructions. While it's quite incredible the quality of the results, the principal problem was and still is, or appears to be, our ability to explain the derivation of how these models produce their conclusions. It isn't really a problem in theoretical studies, but when you actually want to use machine learning in real world scenarios, there are increasingly more regulatory barriers to doing so. In my view, this is the principal advantage of SLODs. Uh, actual measurements are actually being performed. It's not so much a blind reliance on a trained model so much as it is necessarily being uh, advised by it. This is a good point to define more precisely how the original SLODS training was performed with 2D grayscale samples, since it's what my own model is based off of. First, 
random binary measurement masks are generated for a set of sampling densities. Empirically, this is done from 1 to 40% at 1% intervals. And these masks are applied to a set of training samples or images. This creates a set of sparsely measured inputs that might be reasonably expected to be encountered by uh, our algorithm during actual operation. Now, assuming that locations closer to one another or more likely to have similar values. SLODS determines reconstruction values for each of the unmeasured locations through inverse distance weighted mean interpolation. This is found by dividing the inverse square distances from the nearest 10 neighbors by the sum of those distances times the values at those measured locations. From that information, we can extract a set of representative features as the uh, input for our slots network, including measures of density, standard deviation, and gradient. For generating a corresponding set of expected outputs for training, the ground truth RD, ideally for every potential measurement location, would be found as the difference D between the reconstruction having not measured a point, the, the ground truth image being X, and the reconstruction being uh, x, x hat. So the difference between the reconstruction having not measured a point and the difference having actually measured the point would produce the reduction in the actual reduction in distortion. However, this would be quite computationally prohibitive. Um, the original slides instead approximates the ground truth RD. We do is we take the difference of the reconstruction of the sample and approximated x and the actual ground truth x and then we apply a gaussian for each on each unmeasured location say t1 and we use a sigma strength proportional to the distance from that unmeasured location to the position of the nearest measured location divided by a regularization parameter c so effectively this allows us to uh, vary the estimate the impact that one one particular position has on its neighbors through this uh, regularization parameter. The original slots bounds the applied Gaussian to a static 15 by 15 window, though this work uh, also introduces a dynamic option with a radius of three times the sigma value. This is done such that the window does not require manual optimization, as was done in the original slot study. The C parameter was then optimized in original slots by training a model for every potential C value, and then choosing which of those models minimized a distortion metric on the uh, training validation sets, the graph of which is shown here on the right. So to recap, this approximated ground truth RD and the extracted features for multiple densities constitutes the training data for slots. In actual operation, a set of features from a reconstruction formed based off of the known measurements is used as input to the trained SLODS model. This then produces an approximated RD, ERD, shown in the bottom left, by which to select future scanning locations. And while SLODS has shown notable improvements over traditional and even more complex modern machine and deep learning approaches, it has not yet seen widespread adoption outside of a handful of researchers. The initial, and there's a couple reasons for this, the initial slots model relied on a least squares regression. For me, this is somewhat puzzling given that uh, slots was developed around 2016 when there were more advanced models certainly available. Though from what I've seen, the principal concern at that time was developing a more uh, generalizable framework. Second, what publications there are on SLODs tended to rely on limited quantities of synthetically created data. All of these had symmetric square dimensions such as 64 by 64 or 256 by 256. The lack of real world evidence for potential performance gains and the simplistic machine learning model has really been what has prevented slots from integrating with scanning methods and domains where it would prove to be the most useful. The only real advancement on the model was published in 2018 
in the form of slots and net, which replaces the least squares regression for ERD prediction with a simple neural network comprised of 50 neurons uh, in five hidden layers trained with an atom optimizer learning rate of 10 to the negative fifth and training for 500 epochs. There's no early stopping criteria. However, it achieved nearly identical results to the original slots, least squares regression, though it did have better generalization for samples whose uh, information content differed from the training set. More on that in a second. So SLODSnet was at least and potentially is still being used at uh, Argonne National Labs for uh, X-ray crystalline scanning, but there hasn't been any dedicated published works on it for the last couple of years. However, during those last two years, there were there were a couple of standout mentions. Uh, the first is from a German article came out last year, uh, noting SLODS and SLODSnet both had a tendency to oversample regions with structural edges. And it also has a nonlinear scaling of computation times at increased image dimensions. There was a second uh, from a Purdue professor also in 2020 that identified that SLOD's principal limitation was actually that there wasn't a practically demonstrated example that used three dimensions, spatial or spectral. SLODs would most likely need to be would most likely need to perform some kind of reduction back into 2D in order to be computationally viable, or that was the suspicion. And in doing that uh, reduction, you could easily obfuscate information that was particular to single or a handful of uh, channels. Now, as SLODs and SLODs net models were used for comparison against the new architecture that I'll be covering in a couple minutes, I wanted to briefly highlight the published SLODs net study. So therein, both the least squares and the described neural network were trained using only the two images that are shown on the right and then tested over 10 simulations with similar and dissimilar uh, testing image samples, left and right shown on the bottom. The PSNR or peak signal to noise ratio for the produced reconstructions was then graphed over the course of scanning. As mentioned before, SLODs net performance here is pretty much the same as the original SLODs with a marginal improvement to generalization. It's also worthy of note for this one that the image dimensions and the resolutions of all the samples were completely identical. And there is relative to most deep learning studies, at least in my mind, completely insufficient quantities of data used for both the training and the evaluation of a, of a model this large. So the limitations and the potential advantages to the integration of SLODs with nano DESI MSI technology led to uh, the following objectives. Primary is the maximization of throughput for nano DESI MSI scanning through the use of dynamic sampling and supervised learning models. Secondly, the model should be based on the SLODS methodology and should be able to consider both the uh, original least squares regression and the neural network variation presented by SLODSnet such that we at least have some reference for a relative performance gain. Having developed a compatible software, a framework would then be created for the physical integration, as well as to demonstrate the real world capability of the algorithm. Crucially, the algorithm should be able to compensate for any common physical DESI MSI hardware limitations, which again, we'll touch on in a second. Last but not least, the architecture would be updated with an option to use a more advanced and sophisticated deep learning architecture both to leverage the third dimension of the mass spectral data and to have a greater spatial awareness during sampling through the use of convolutional layers. So now we need to have a more detailed understanding of the DESI MSI data. Now Purdue provided a couple of different tissue types obtained during their development of nano DESI. These included uh, mouse pancreatic, kidney, and uterine samples at a wide variety of qualities. Uh, some of these samples have experimental defects, such that the raw line files were not included when they were transferred to us. There are also different resolutions, file formats, stages of post-processing, uh, 
uh, critically different levels of documented metadata and as obtained through differently charged solvents. When the, when the solvent is deposited onto the sample in DESI MSI, it can either be positively charged or negatively charged. In total, at, last, at my last count at least, there were eight pancreatic, 18 uterine, and five kidney samples. Ten of the kidney, sorry, ten of the uterine samples were obtained with positively charged solvent at sampling rates between 10 and 15 micrometers per second, allegedly. And crucially, these 10 samples uh, also had sufficient metadata for them to be properly simulated. So visualizations of the total ion chromatograms, or TICs, uh, that is to say the sum of the whole spectrum at all the scan locations for these particular samples are shown at the top. These 10 samples were split randomly into sets with six for training, uh, two for validation, and two for testing. Adjustments were made to the height values for each of the samples based on the number of missing line files and the distance between the, between the lines as uh, measured by Purdue. Now, there's a, there's a lot of data presented here, and you might, you might be tempted to ask, why did we only use 10 of these? So during this work's development, one of the goals was always to have a physical proof of concept for the integration of the algorithm, particularly given the variety here and variety of tissues and the limited number of samples, relatively speaking, ideally to get the best possible result for the first physical experiment. Uh, ideally, the model should be trained for the specific tissue type and the equipment settings, crucially the, uh, the sampling rate, the resolution, that was intended to be used. After that proof, then a more thorough investigation of the model's ability to generalize and handle different tissues and settings could be considered. Naturally then, the training and testing sets constantly evolved and changed along the course of the code's development according to what tissue appeared to be the most likely to uh, be, be available at Purdue's lab. As the updated slides code became more sophisticated, more of the post-processing steps that were initially done by Purdue uh, also became integrated and optimized in slides. And of course, this, the, these uh, post-processing steps had to be tested on most of the different tissue types, but the, uh, the clearest resolution samples were typically the uh, uterine and kidney. Locations scanned with DESI MSI are not square, what I would refer to as a uh, symmetric coordinate system. Uh, they're almost always rectangular or asymmetric. Um, the locations themselves, even on the same line, are not necessarily consistent in width, but they are at least consistent in height. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned earlier, not even the same number of positions are acquired on each line. If, as was done in, the, in a couple of the originally provided sample files, the data was trimmed to a consistent number of columns per row, then there results a uh, misalignment between the lines, as shown in the, the left-hand image. And this is typically handled in MSI during post-processing, with linear interpolation of the acquisition times for, on each row to a larger number of values. And this larger number of values was irrespective to the specified equipment sampling rate or indeed the original timestamps in the image. So say a thousand, a thousand positions as shown uh, both in the upper right and the image in the center. And this realigns the rows without any loss of, without necessarily any loss of quality, but it also changes the result in nearest neighbor searches. So essentially, the sample data is all artificially stretched, which exacerbates a problem that was already introduced by the asymmetric location dimensions. There's an inbuilt tendency resulting uh, that the algorithm will scan positions vertically. This behavior can be seen in the lower right for a uh, uh, measured binary mask acquired point by point um, from an early version of the algorithm where there appears to be a blurring or a stretching artifacts along the vertical dimension. So as a contrast, 
The same version of the code was able to produce the measurement mask in the lower right without stretching artifacts. The solution to do this is twofold. First, the code needed to realign the rows, and then it needs to temporarily rescale the image so that each position has the same vertical and horizontal dimensions as seen in the upper right. The best way to handle the realignment was still performing a linear interpolation. However, instead of using an arbitrary selection of a thousand columns, the number of positions was instead based on the originally intended or specified equipment sampling rate, which is determined uh, prior to the physical acquisition. Finally, uh, well, more specifically, the number of new columns is just the uh, physical sample width, not just the tissue, but the uh, field of view for the instrument, uh, divided by the sampling rate. Again, this, this preserves the originally expected resolution while also realigning the rows. When determining where to physically scan, this is the coordinate system used, the one in the, the center there, where you have roughly 40 lines vertically. However, when passing any of the information through a mechanism and slots where you would consider spatial relationships, so that would be uh, the convolutional neural network that we'll get into in a minute, or uh, when you perform uh, reconstruction, which relies on nearest neighbor search, then we consider then we temporarily rescale the data along the vertical axis is done in the upper right image such that the distance from one position to the next is the same, whether this is measured vertically or horizontally. So having developed a process for making the raw MSI data more consistent, uh, it has to be considered how to actually make use of the data as there exists another dimension, a dimension not only of spatial height and width, but of mass per charge, a journey into a land with slots employing MZ for improved sampling performance. Humor aside, there are upwards of 10,000 MZ intensity pairs in each spectrum, the vast majority of which do not contain any meaningful information. Over a whole sample, this quickly adds up into a computational uh, maybe not impossibility, but improbability to deal with. So let's say you wanted to visualize the spatial distribution of a molecule at around 219 MZ, since that's where we see the strongest signal in the spectrum shown, this spectrum being a, a random spectrum picked out somewhere in a uterine sample. Well, first, since there isn't necessarily an intensity value for that specific MZ, in the spectrum of every measured location in the sample, you have to use a window range, determine a window range uh, based off of the instrument error rating, its, its precision. Uh, for this work, that error was about 20 parts per million, as indicated by Purdue, where the window range in MZ can be found with the formula shown in the bottom left. You may note that this uh, increases the window size at higher MZ values. So the further you progress along the spectrum, the less molecular specificity you tend to have. Now, the signal intensity values for all of the MZ in that determined range have to be summed or integrated for each of the measured spectra in the sample. Then you perform the row realignment procedure to the result such that the geometry is being represented correctly internally. So, uh, in practice, this makes it quite impractical to use all of the data with slots, all of the spectral data. And if an experimentalist didn't know what MZ were important in advance of performing a scan, you would need to visualize any and all prominent non-overlapping peaks across the whole sample. And then you would have to apply uh, additional criteria or models to isolate interesting MZ. But uh, that's a presentation for the future. For this work, prior to training a model, a subset of MZ have to be chosen so that the model inputs, the channel inputs to the model are consistent. And then there also needs to be a mechanism introduced for modifying the reduction and distortion to handle a third dimension of spectral data. are principally two scenarios where slots could actually be applied in nanodesi. Uh, 
Uh, one where the experimentalist has a specific set of molecules that are, or MZ, that are known to be of interest. And two, where the specific values are not known, but the experimentalist would like to uh, isolate scanning to just the tissue area. And this would presume that the experimentalist has enough uh, fully obtained raster scanned data uh, in order to actually train the model. This work focused on the latter, later scenario, though there are plans to explore the former in the near future. So in order to find MZ, commonly representative of the uterine tissue type, foreground masks were created through automated image processing of the TIC for the available samples, so the total ion chromatogram shown earlier. So visualized MZ for each sample were then scored according to their intersection over union with the mask uh, in terms of the foreground minus the background to help spread, spread out some of the values. Uh, the chosen MZ for one of the samples, those with an MZ score above 0.5 are shown on the right with the corresponding score distribution and the foreground mask used shown in the lower left. The scoring procedure was repeated for all 10 of the samples shown on the left, and then finding the chosen MZ that are common to the uterine samples within 20 ppm then results in just 11 MZ shown on the right, and these are what are ultimately going to be used as the model inputs. For the SLODS models used in this study, features are still only extracted from a single image. So that, so for SLODS and SLODSnet, that would be the uh, reconstructed average of all the chosen MZ channels, the 11 channels. For the updated architecture, uh, it can handle all 11 channels of information at the same time. Uh, however, what will ultimately be found and shown is that using 22 channels, uh, by splitting the reconstruction and measured values apart tends to perform better. So with the chosen MZ in hand, it has to be considered how to actually incorporate this information into the uh, reduction in distortion for use during actual training. Again, there are two variations that were used. The first version that's shown here uh, is simply averages all of the 11 channels into a single image. And this presents the risk of obfuscating features that are unique to certain channels, as we mentioned before. However, in the unique case where all of the channels generally represent the same objective, as is in the case of this particular project scope, the foreground, uh, this won't be an issue. There, does, there is a second variation, uh, which performs a reconstruction for each channel independently. And then we take the difference with respect to its ground truth counterpart and some of the differences to form a single channel. The additional reconstructions does increase the number of required calculations, but at least for scaling to just 11 channels, really, this wasn't found to have an appreciable impact on the training time, at least. This latter approach assumes that each channel is equally important, but it does uh, entirely remove the risk that scanning is going to be biased towards a single or just a few MZ. There is one last item peculiar to DESI MSI, that the scanning equipment obtains information line by line rather than point by point. So once a line or a row has been chosen for acquisition, uh, the hardware wasn't designed to change position vertically. It only moves from left to right. This means that the new line bounded or uh, line wise variants had to be developed for the ease of initial implementation. Funnily enough, there are another two variants. Um, the first one is noted as uh, percent line wise, where we choose a set percentage of a chosen line to scan with points on that line selected by the ERD value. Uh, if there are fewer points than the specified percentage, that have ERD values greater than zero, then only those points will be scanned. For this study, that percentage was empirically chosen to be 40%. The initial measurement scans a random 40% of the points in the middle row, after which the ERD is used for the subsequent uh, scanning point determinations. The second variation shown here uh, 
performs the same set of operations as the first, but instead it scans all the points between the uh, earliest and the last determined positions. Uh, this version was introduced given the limited ability uh, to control the proprietary uh, MSI equipment, though workarounds are expected to be forthcoming in the next couple of months uh, that should at least allow us to use the percent line-wise mode in actual operation. This takes us to the new model architecture uh, named DLODS or a deep learning approach for dynamic sampling. DLODS as a program was principally developed to overcome some of the aforementioned issues uh, noted for past SLOD studies using convolutional layers to improve spatial awareness. Essentially, the presented problem in, in this study is an image to image regression task. So taking in a single or multi-channel image of measured or reconstructed MSI data and then using a model to transform it into an expected reduction in distortion image. The principal structure was based on the UNET architecture with some slight modifications. So all of the convolutional layers in here use three by three kernels. Uh, he initialization and ReLU activations following best practices. Uh, the last three layers uh, to the farthest right, though, use one by one kernels as we uh, perform a dimensionality reduction into a single output channel. Each layer of depth in the architecture uses two back to back convolutional layers, and then we perform upscaling with bilinear interpolation uh, following the bottleneck instead of convolutional transpose layers. Uh, this was done in order to prevent checkerboard artifacting. Batch normalization was not used since doing so allows the network to uh, train on arbitrarily sized input, input outputs, so long as the resolutions are the same or very similar. As an alternate method to help reduce uh, the potential for overfitting, two dropout layers were or are located before and after the, the bottleneck. During actual training, a minimum of 10 epochs are performed, after which if there is no improvement on the validation set loss within 50 epochs, the training terminates and the best weights are found for the model uh, are restored. The loss function optimizer, uh, the set of inputs and the learning rate were all determined through an ablation study um, that will be shown shortly. An optional augmentation stage was also set up for DLODs with operations randomly applied in the hopes of uh, further reducing overfitting and improving the model's generalization ability. Uh, a quick example of running the color wheel image shown on the left uh, through this process can be seen on the right. These potential operations included uh, vertical and horizontal flips, rescaling, rotations, and translation. Uh, another, another good question that I would expect to be asked is, well, why, why not introduce additional Gaussian noise into the process? Um, my principal answer to that would be that there is very little information that we're using to train this network, and given its tendency to overfit, um, we didn't want to introduce anything that would um, necessarily detract from the model performance. So overall, this is a visualization of the sampling procedure pipeline, as it were. Uh, training and validation sets are created at a variety of sampling densities with approximated reduction in distortion ground truth images. Uh, models are then trained where the SLODs uh, variations first extract feature vectors from the image reconstructions. The resulting trained models can then be used in actual implementations or uh, indeed simulations. Three different studies were performed for optimization of the regularization C value mentioned earlier. So we considered uh, the original averaging RD with static and dynamic windows, as well as the new summation RD with uh, the dynamic window. The training data was simulated with pointwise acquisition up to 40% using the approximated ground truth RD in order to determine measurement locations, rather than training a model for each potential C value and then figuring out which model would perform the best. Uh, 
This saves us actually a, a great deal of time in terms of training. The PSNR between the reconstructions for the 11 chosen MZ and their ground truth counterparts was determined every 1% measured. So averaging the average, integrating the average area under the curve for all of the samples then produces an AUC area under curve score for each of the C values. In all three scenarios that were examined, 16 was found to be optimal for the MSI data that was used. The value also closely corresponds to the value of 20 that was found to be optimal in the first SLODS publication. Uh, looking at the original RD with use of static and dynamic windows, the dynamic window uh, actually either matches or exceeds the performance of the static approach, regardless of the employed C value. Also, apart from the C value of one, the summation RD method outperforms the original averaging approach. A quick reference before looking at the uh, ablation results are the metrics that were used for evaluation. Principally, these are all based on the peak signal to noise ratio or PSNR, as was used in the uh, original and past SLAS publications. Uh, objectively, the ablation study looked at finding a combination of parameters and inputs that would minimize the training time and the percentage of measurements necessary in order to achieve a reasonable reconstruction of all 11 chosen MZ channels. Uh, empirically, this value was chosen at an average 33 dB PSNR, though this value admittedly doesn't have any in innate significance. Shown here are the ground truth average of the chosen MZ for one of the training samples, along with reconstructions of that uh, averaged input, averaged image at different sampling densities, um, all of which were generated randomly, uh, just to showcase the potential for perceptual differences between uh, different PSNR scores. The performance then for each of the simulated models uh, was the inverse average percentage needed for the reconstructions of the MZ channels to reach 33 dB PSNR times the inverse of the number of training steps required to find the best weights. So we're looking to minimize both the amount of time that's training and the percentage necessary to achieve a reasonable reconstruction. Now, this performance measure was really only applicable to the DLODS model. Since SLODSnet doesn't possess early stopping criteria, and SLODS, the least squares version of it, uh, is performed in a single regression step. So, final decisions regarding the DLODS architecture were all made using simulated pointwise acquisition of the validation set. The first study varied the inputs to the modified architecture shown earlier using a NADM optimizer, mean absolute error or MAE, learning rate of 10 to the negative fourth, and summation RD uh, as well as a dynamic window. The primary inputs that were considered were combinations of the reconstruction values and or measured values for each of the MZ channels as well as averaged versions of these. So um, shrinking down the 11 and 22 layers down to one or two layer, uh, two channels. It was thereby determined that uh, using the reconstruction and measured values for each of the 11 MZ in a total of 22 channels provided the best relative performance and the best uh, final PSNR at 40%. Using these optimal inputs, a subsequent examination was made of the optimizer, the learning rate, and the loss functions. So starting with the mean absolute error loss, DLODS models were trained with ADAM, NADAM, and RMS, or root mean square propagation optimizers, at sampling rates of uh, 1 times 10 to the negative third down to 1 times 10 to the negative fifth. Again, simulations with pointwise acquisition were performed with the validation set, finding that the use of an atom optimizer at a learning rate of 10 to the negative fourth yielded the best uh, performance. These simulations were also performed with the mean squared error or MSE loss, where NADAM with a learning rate of 10 to the negative fourth was the best performing, 
and Adam at the same rate had the best PSNR at 40%. Uh, however, overall the MAE loss was the better performer as compared to the MSE. Next, the employment of the earlier mentioned augmentation stage was considered with the determined optimized inputs, optimizer, loss, learning rate. Additional versions of the base training set, so six samples comprising 1 to 40% measurements for 240 input output pairs were added by running them through the uh, augmentation stage in order to produce two, 480, 720, and 960 input output pairs. Well, there is a improvement to the model's performance with augmentation, the most of which is seen with the model trained with 720 input output pairs. There wasn't really judged a large enough change to justify the additional required training time. Lastly, uh, it must be considered the relative worth of using multiple MZ channels as input. The dynamic window and summation RD methods as well with the SLODS and SLODSnet models. And then we also want, I also wanted to examine which of these two models, SLODS, the least squares, or the neural network, uh, worked best with the MSI data. Ideally, the dynamic window should perform at least as well as the manually optimized static window, and the summation RD should at least perform as well as the original. Um, of course, for the specific use case, uh, where all of the chosen MZ are roughly compatible with the same overall objective, uh, herein being isolation in the foreground, uh, it is expected that the summation RD would show a noticeable uh, advantage in other scenarios. So for the original slots, there's a clear advantage to considering uh, multiple channels, despite the fact that they're all being averaged together. And also, despite the static window with original RD yielding a higher average PSNR at 40%, the summation window with a dynamic, the summation RD with a dynamic window uh, demonstrated better overall performance in reaching the 33 dB target. The dynamic window also had uh, improved performance compared to uh, its static counterpart. SLOSNET, um, somewhat surprisingly, uh, underperformed the least squares regression in the same simulations, where the original RD and static window were found to have the highest performance. For the final pointwise simulations, using uh, actually finally now using the testing set, a SLODS model with only a single channel as input, the original RD and a static window was included, uh, as the closest uh, the code could actually replicate the original slides publication while still retaining the ability to process MSI data. This was compared against the best updated slides model with least squares regression, the summation RD and dynamic window, as well as the uh, optimized DLAS model as it was trained with uh, an atom optimizer, MAE loss, uh, 10 to the negative fourth learning rate, dynamic window, summation RD, but uh, without augmentation. While the DLODS model produced the highest PSNR at 40%, uh, it was the updated SLODS model that was surprisingly the first to the uh, threshold of 33 dB. However, this can be seen to be more of an exception, as when you actually look at the graph PSNR progression, the DLODS model outperforms SLODS at every percentage above roughly 12%. Now, assuming that a 33 dB PSNR reconstruction would be acceptable for uh, lab's objectives, then uh, it can be said that both SLODs and DLODs are capable of nearly a 90% reduction in the number of required measurements. Linewise simulations for both percent and segment modes were also performed with the testing set. Un somewhat un unsurprisingly, uh, neither of these was directly competitive with the pointwise uh, acquisitions. Nonetheless, there's still a significant improvement to the simulated throughput. There's uh, about a 50% reduction for the segment linewise and then 70% reduction for the percent linewise in order to achieve 33 dB. Regardless of the similar levels of performance that are seen between SLODs and DLODs,
in producing sparse sampling reconstructions, uh, actually looking at the ability of the models to produce ERD uh, shows a different story. DLODS offers a substantial benefit of roughly an average 20 dB PSNR between its produced ERD and approximated ground truth RD as compared to the least squares SLODS uh, network during the course of pointwise scanning. This ultimately should be seen to translate into better intertissue generalization, uh, though it was decided that that would be outside of this study scope. Here is a, a static look at the binary measurement masks and the averaged reconstructions for one of the testing samples as they developed at uh, roughly 10, 20, and 30% sampling densities for each of the models. In pointwise scanning, DLODs tended to have a more diverse set of measurement locations than either the single or multi-channel multi SLODs variants. The spatial awareness from the convolutional layers has better informed the ERD, and it's removed oversampling the edges of the tissue structures noted in pre uh, previous publications as a principal drawback to using SLODs. There also can be seen a clear distinction between the single channel and the multi-channel SLODs masks, where the latter seems to focus on scanning features uh, quite distinct from the former. For the line-wise variants, the percent variation shows a reconstruction without major visual artifacts by about 30%. This is in contrast to the segmented method, which will almost always scan more pixels on each chosen line since uh, you know, we're scanning every point between the starting and the end point rather than uh, choosing fewer points on each line. Since it hasn't scanned as many lines as the percent line-wise variant, uh, it's rather unsurprisingly to find uh, that there is an insufficient information to provide a good reconstruction at 30%. These same patterns and observations can be seen and drawn for the second testing sample as well. Again, DLODS reduces edge clustering and a distinct advantage is shown for the percent line-wise method over the segmented approach. Briefly then, I have a short animation here of the DLODS point-wise sampling for one of the testing samples. Uh, each of the frames is spaced at 1% intervals. The average of the 11 chosen MZ is shown in the upper left. The absolute difference between the ground truth and uh, the average reconstruction in the upper right. Uh, binary mask of what positions have been scanned in the lower left. The ERD, as produced by the DLADS model in the lower middle, and the RD, which what the, uh, the model, what the ERD should look like in the lower right. I'll just give that a second to finish up a second time. Similarly, uh, here is a short animation of the percent line-wise acquisition for the same sample. Uh, it may be noted that the majority of the visual artifacts that are present in the uh, average reconstruction are eliminated by about 30% uh, measured field of view um, or about the empirically specified 33 dB PSNR threshold. Again, I'll just give that a second to finish. So there remains a quite a bit of material remaining to do in this line of research. Uh, speaking in the short term first, roughly, that is to say, roughly in the next year, uh, Purdue has provided a set of 10 MG, MZ values or molecules of particular interest for the uterine samples acquired with positively charged solvent. And they've also indicated some more specific regions that uh, should be targeted, shown on the right. This is principally where some of the methods that were developed in this work uh, should actually prove their worth. Mentioned earlier, there are other tissue sets at hand that could be simulated. Uh, aside from the required metadata, the principal reason that these weren't used in the study is that the MZ representative of the foreground for the uterine samples uh, wasn't found to overlap that well with the kidney data. And I haven't had a great chance to look at the uh, pancreatic data that we have available. 
In general, it seemed increasingly less likely that pancreatic would be a target in Purdue's own line of research. I believe um, they're moving on to either brain or hum uh, either mouse or human brain tissues. Uh, that being said, the more with the more targeted molecules of interest, a simulated cross tissue study should be uh, more relatively easy to perform. Then there's the physical integration, which looks like it should have a proof of concept experiment performed sometime in September. An honorable mention for the short term would be an alternative metric for PSNR. Uh, it is well known PSNR is not a great measure of perceptual differences. Uh, there were attempts to quantify the quality with uh, other metrics such as the uh, Structural Similarity Index, SSIM, but that really has its own shortcomings and it also didn't lend any uh, additional insights into the results beyond what was seen for PSNR. In the longer term, DESI-MSI has a lot of peculiar characteristics uh, that this work spent a lot of time figuring out how to compensate for. Uh, most, most notably is the line-wise constraint, um, the inconsistent location dimensions, and the inconsistent sampling rates. Uh, while there was a clear advantage demonstrated for integrating slots and DLODs despite these, uh, it was also seen that replacing the segment line-wise with percent line-wise, and then the percent line-wise with point-wise, uh, also offers significant benefits to throughput. Uh, therefore, you know, short, short of a vendor uh, getting in touch with a vendor and actually figuring out how we can uh, better integrate the algorithm with DESI technology, uh, we, we can certainly look at alternate MSI technologies, uh, particularly uh, MALDI, where the data is being acquired point by point. Um, where we, in, in that case, we would expect an even greater throughput improvement. Uh, the fact is, is that DLODS allows for three-dimensional hyperspectral data um, in contrast to SLODS, which allows this work to really extend beyond uh, MSI potentially. Uh, lastly, the study limited itself from employing adversarial networks. Uh, as Dr. Povanelli might recall, uh, I actually tried to implement a GAN to simulate dynamic sparse sampling on DESI pancreatic samples a couple of years ago. However, given the complexities of the MSI data that we've gone through, uh, development time has been more focused instead towards uh, iterative rather than disruptive designs. Uh, now that UNET has shown some degree of success, more advanced architectures can and should be considered, um, perhaps in conjunction with deep learning models for the reconstruction, where we might see uh, more in benefit to the improved uh, quality of the ERD being produced by the DLODS model. So, in conclusion, SLODS and SLODSnet have been updated for integration with MSI technology. A more advanced deep learning architecture was implemented in DLODs capable of nearly 90% reduction in the number of required measurements in pointwise operations with a 20 dB PSNR improvement to the produced ERD. Theoretically, this would, tra this would translate directly into a high resolution uterine sample being acquired in 24 minutes rather than four hours. Further, a framework was produced for experimental integration with two potential line-wise acquisition modes that allow for either uh, anywhere between 50 and 70 percent reduction in the number of required measurements, doubling a lab's throughput capabilities without uh, necessarily creating uh, a massive incompatibility with most of uh, the hardware that's uh, currently available for DESI MSI. Overall, this research has maximized the throughput of nano DESI MSI through dynamic sampling, as it set out to do. There have been a couple of attempts at publishing this work. Though so far, a uh, proceedings paper has made it out into the wild in the Journal of Electronic Imaging. Another uh, full article is planned for submission to IEEE Transactions in October. And then there is another paper with Purdue um, regarding the physical integration results still scheduled by the end of this year. The majority of the code developed for this work has been made publicly available under the GNU uh, General Public License version 3 on uh, my GitHub repository, along with the needed documentation necessary for actually using it. Uh, 
This is just a quick listing of the sources that were cited during the course of uh, this thesis's development. And with that, I will open up the floor uh, for any questions you all might have. Thank you all for your attention. Okay, yeah, thank you, David. Yeah, thank you for your nice presentation. So this now is open for the question. Any question from anybody? Any student? I have a question. This is Fred. Um, the sparse sampling techniques like compressed sensing used for magnetic resonance imagery construction seem to work better when the image itself is sparse. For instance, a, an image which is mostly black and may have uh, just a few white lines through it, like a vascular image with contrast. So my question for you is, um, have you looked at your technique in terms of uh, how the PS and R is variable based on the actual different types of images. I mean, primarily, I think you looked at murine uterus images, but do you have any um, ideas? Again, it's not a question you have to answer, just sort of wondering or curious about it. Well, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we can, I did consider a number of different um, metrics such as SSIM to try and overcome that particular problem. And indeed, um, you know, where we have images, or specific uterine images that don't take up as much area um, in the total uh, image field of view for the equipment, there is higher PSNR. Um, it's, it's something that uh, the study didn't particularly pay much attention to. Um, it is something, however, that That's we would okay. like to overcome yeah, in the future. So um, perhaps. Yeah, it, it shares a similar uh, behavior as compressed sensing then in that regard. It, it does, uh, certainly with regards to uh, MRI. Um, there is definitely the possibility, I, as mentioned uh, in the written work, of potentially extending this into MRI fields or CT research as well, um, though I'm not as familiar with those imaging technologies. Thanks. You're welcome. Any uh, any additional questions? Yeah, one thing I just want to add uh, regarding the question. So the compressed sensing is very popular, but is based on the stochastic uh, processing, the stochastic uh, processing to compute the the conditional entropy. So here in our method is the ERD. We use the machine learning approach to estimate those the entropy. Uh, entity, so it which is much faster. So uh, actually, that's the reason why we use this the machine learning approach over this the compressed sensing approach. So we have some advantage in, over it. In in yeah. in general in general terms, I mean, you can look at slots as being a more probabilistic rather than a stochastic approach. Yeah, and in that sense, it relates directly to compressed sensing. Uh, any other question? Hey, so David, this is Richard. Um, I do remember the GAN, <laughs> the fun you had with that one. Um, GANs are tricky, aren't they? Um, oh, they're so, fun. Uh, yeah, so um, one question I had, and this was just kind of a misunderstanding. Several times you mentioned simulation um, versus kind of actual data. Um, but it seemed to me right. that your simulations were on real samples. I don't, I didn't think you had any samples that were simulated. So, so explain what that means. The, so the actual process of scanning um, the samples that were pre-obtained. So they are actual real biological samples that were uh, obtained with a raster scanning pattern. And we take those and we simulate actually scanning them in practice. Is that, um, is that a... So there is just a, a distinction between uh, the simulation of um, pre-obtained uh, biological tissues versus um, the actual implementation of actually running it on uh, the physical equipment, which we haven't been able to uh, 
uh, quite manage yet. Uh, it's uh, more of a time constraint, if nothing else. Okay, so I understand. So the simulation part that you're talking about is you're simulating the sampling, um, but you're sampling real raster scanned images. Correct. Okay. And another question. So sure. you talked about it being 3D. I didn't quite, so I can understand the, the two dimensions, kind of the, the height or the, the width and the length. And then you mentioned, so what is that third dimension? Is that actually three dimensional in space or is that that? Oh, it is uh, three dimensional in terms of uh, the spectra. If I just go back. OK, to, so that's the spectra is the third dimension. It is the spectra. Okay. You could. Technically, I mean, you could use a third spectral dimension and you would have the same challenges that you would have with using the spectral data. Um, so it's not beyond consideration to say that we could do it in 3D spatial. Um, and then we would be looking at, you know, uh, we'd have to reconsider the reduction and distortion image, uh, image again, the formation of that. Okay. So to, uh, I have a question that's uh, related to, to this. I think that uh, maybe I'm a little confused now, or maybe I was a little confused before. So do, do you think maybe, can you go back to, I believe it's like 22, just, just so we have a picture to look at as we talk. Um, yeah, okay, there we go, the, the network architecture. So right. the input to your network, is it like an 11 channels image? Uh, it is a, tw the end network uses 22. So we split right. up the reconstruction and the measured values. And the specific channels for those are uh, those 11 that are shown on the right here. So, so, so these are both? fully sampled of those 11 channels. And that is essentially the sparse measurements of these images. And then their reconstructed values constitutes the input to the network. So. OK, so, so you have right. So, so you have those 11 channels. So you have this 3D volume, right, where you have, you know, a uh, thousand, let's say on average a thousand columns by 40 rows and then 11 channels. You have this Probably, volume yeah, yeah. and that volume is your input. Or right. I mean, the, or, or well, I mean, not, that not, not spatial volume, but three, three dimensions of data. Right, and that so that's like after the the the, the reconstruction, the interpolation. So now that's the part that I'm I'm confused. So so when you say both the measure and the reconstructed values are inputs, basically what you're saying is that you get the measure values, you do the reconstruction by doing interpolation with those values, and that you know, 3D array mm -hmm. is, is your input, right? It's, we found that it was important to separate the measured values for what positions had been scanned versus uh, what the reconstructed values were for unmeasured locations in order just to try and guide the ERD to um, say, look, th these are the these are the values that were these are the locations that we're principally interested in. If we've measured something in these 11 channels, then the ERD should absolutely be zero in the output. Uh, we shouldn't have to expect to rescan um, a position that we've previously scanned before. It just won't make sense. So in terms, yeah, but, but then that's the thing. That's my question. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going in the right direction. I think, but then in, in terms of, of network architecture, what does it mean by, by separating those two pieces of information? Uh, it, How means are they very, it means, it means very little in terms of the actual network architecture. We just, we just specify, Hey, there are 22 input channels coming in. And as long as we're consistent with the number of channels for each of the trained models, then we don't necessarily find any problems with that. There's something to be said about, you know, we're inputting two channels in one case and we're inputting 22 channels in another case. Um, and then maybe, you know, your concern might be uh, the network might might not have enough breadth or depth in order to uh, accommodate those ex extra channels. Um, in practice, though, we didn't find that to be the case. Um, we saw tendencies towards overfitting um, after the early stopping criteria regardless. Um, so we're confident that the uh, network was large enough to accommodate those regardless. Okay, we so might be seeing additional overfitting in fewer channels. I, I wouldn't put that past it, but then again, that's also why there's that early stopping criteria. But then I think, yeah, those those are uh, concerns that I had, and, and and that's great. But then if you go to uh, let's say, so so you you have 22 channels you're in, in your input. So what's your output? 
Do you also have Uplink is two always channel? one channel. One channel. one channel. ERD. And that ERD is, you, you get that from, from averaging all the it, other channels. It has to collapse down into a single image by which we can decide where to scan next. If we didn't do it in the architecture, we would have to do it after the fact anyway, because we can't choose specific MZ channels to measure. We can only choose specific spatial positions to measure. Right. So, so, so you think that there wouldn't be a benefit to having an, uh, a, like a, a 22 or an 11 channel output as well? Uh, as a matter of fact, I did, I did try a version of that um, fairly early on. There wasn't a perceived benefit to doing so. Um, in fact, there was, I mean, you have an additional time constraint then of, well, now you got to process these 22 channels that have come out of the network. Um, it's something that we could certainly consider in the future. It would, I think it would be more applicable to a case, uh, like we were saying before, a 3D spatial uh, information, an actual volume. Then you would look at you know, a, a 2.5 dimension um, where you'd have slices of your 3D and you would determine where to scan in that third uh, spatial dimension. But in this case, that's not something that's really applicable. Okay. Um, all right, yeah, I guess. I guess that, that that that's it. I mean, I do have some more questions, but we, we can talk about that more offline. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, David, this is Richard again. Um, so, your error metric. Could you explain that to me a little bit more? Uh, which one, sir? The the one that had the two um, reciprocals in it. Um, uh, the performance measure. You mean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this yes. was an error in the written portion of the draft that was sent out. Um, we're essentially trying to minimize the average percentage of measurements to reach an arbitrary threshold, 33 dB. And we're also trying to minimize uh, the amount of training of the model that's necessary in order to reach that target. Okay. That is, that is something that has uh, since been corrected from the draft. Okay. So. The, the training steps is the training of the neural network. Is that correct? If I understand that, correctly? that is correct. Uh, for the uh, for all for most of the ablation studies, that's just the number of epochs um, okay. is the number of training steps. For the uh, augmentation, though, we did consider um, you know the number of steps is the number of epochs times the number of input output pairs. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Hey, David. This is Najib. Hello, Najib. Hey, David. Great presentation. I have just one question. Sure. Uh, talking about the augmentation you mentioned, uh, on purpose you did not augment with noise, uh, considering the uh, things to learn from the image. Yeah. But in general, the noise are a primary factor in terms of imaging, right? Uh, so it is. have you have have we evaluated with uh, different levels of noise and how your how your model performance gets impacted? Just curious. So I have not uh, particularly spent a lot of time looking at uh, introducing additional noise into the inputs. Principally, it's because uh, most of the models tend to have some degree of noise in them to start with, um, given that all of our data is uh, real world biological tissue and it's not synthetically generated. Um, so it was you know, expected, you know, we want to train the model to accommodate the expected levels of noise in the image but uh, for this particular study, you know, um, trying if we, if we, if we were <clears throat> sorry, losing my voice. If we were looking at multiple different uh, acquisition machines, different hardware aspects or different vendors um, at that point, then I would consider, you know, trying to vary the amount of noise because you would expect different levels of noise from different equipment. Uh, in this case, we're using the exact same instrumentation for all of the samples, so there wasn't uh, necessarily really a benefit to uh, performing an ablation study with added noise. I hope that answers your question a bit. Yes, it does. Thank you, David. Thank you for your question. Yeah. OK, so now it's four. Now it's 315 and OK, so if you don't have any question, OK, so we're going to have the committee meeting. Uh, so yeah, please leave this uh, session. And and the all committee members, uh, please stay here. <laughs>